Hi, I'm John Schreiber. For 18 seasons, the New Jersey Performing Arts Center has been the state's premier home to world-class and community-centered performances. We pride ourselves on presenting something for everyone. That's why we're proud to partner with the Caucus Educational Corporation to produce One-on-One -on -one with Steve Adubato at NJPAC. This unique series features some of the best talent New Jersey has produced. We're pleased to welcome them and you to the Arts Center. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been provided by Prudential Financial's Global Communications Department, United Airlines, the New Jersey Education Association, NJ Best, New Jersey's 529 College Savings Plan, Turn a Dream into a Degree, Josh S. Weston, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, and by the law firm of Gibbons PC. This is one on one. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. You see, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Welcome to the New Jersey Performing Arts Center. I'm Steve Adubato. This is One on One from NJ Pack. We are pleased to welcome Rachel Barton Pine, an internationally acclaimed concert violinist. Good to see you. Great to be here. I'm going to get a couple of facts on the table. Tell me if I'm wrong. Tell me if my research is right. Uh, child Prodigy, you started playing at three? Three and a half. Oh, yes. sorry. Uh, you <laughs> played with the Chicago Symphony at 10? Yep. How does that happen? Well, I made my debut as soloist with orchestra when I was seven, and then the Chicago Symphony appearance was thanks to a local competition, um, and it just really inspired me to keep doing what I'm doing. Did you fall, you must have fallen in love with the violin. Exactly. I, when I was three, I saw some middle school age girls playing violin in my church, and they had on the most beautiful long dresses, and I loved the sound of the instrument, and that was it. I was just obsessed. And as soon as I started lessons, that was it for me. So, so just, okay, yeah, that was it for you, then, but, but here's my problem with this. I also, uh, by the way, I'll plug a couple. Help me plug these, and I'm going to tell you what I have a problem with. Tell me what this is. Mozart. This is your CD? <laughs> my Mozart. new one. It's coming out in January, okay. and um, it's the complete Mozart Violin Concertos with Sir Neville Mariner and the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields. I've heard of them. Really Next. a dream come true. Watch, watch us do this. Next. Okay. Oh, I think I know where you're going. Just keep going. <laughs> Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, my last CD. Mendelssohn. Recorded in Germany. Yes. Next. That's my metal band, Earth oh, and Grave. You're me <laughs> I'm sorry, your metal band? <laughs> Can't you tell? <laughs> well, hold on. Let me get this straight. You play with the Chicago Symphony at 10, you're a child prodigy at three, and you're into heavy metal. Well, I discovered metal a couple <laughs> of years after that, when Santa Claus brought me my first transistor radio, and I started searching up and down the dial for what other kind of music existed, and practicing classical eight hours a day, I really needed something to relax to, wow. which you wouldn't think metal's relaxing, but it did the job. Amazing. <laughs> Growing up as a kid, you were not uh, born into great wealth, Oh my gosh, well, far from it. Um, my father was unemployed through much of my childhood and my mom was raising me and my younger sisters and helping take care of all of the things I needed for my musical studies, driving me to mm. rehearsals every night and homeschooling me at the suggestion of my school principal. Mm. Um, and so it was really a lot of sacrifice and a very tenuous existence. Our um, electricity and phone were always being cut off and sometimes we were one missed payment away from losing the roof over our heads and to be pursuing something like playing the violin in the face of all that almost seems nonsensical but I just really believed that this is what I was meant to do with my life and this is what I can contribute to the world by uplifting people's spirits with my music and I just trusted that things would work out somehow and thanks to generous supporters and friends and family and even strangers, um, it all ended up working. But you also wound up starting a foundation. What's exactly. Well, I realized that the best way that I could 
give back and honor those who helped me along the way would be to return the favor and try to support the next generation. So we've actually um, supported more than 50 young artists at this point. Um, young people from the age of 10 um, to their late 20s who are you know, studying on the brink of important careers and, and really don't have the financial means for, it's not the lessons, because you can usually get a scholarship you know, at your music school, but it's all that other stuff, buying the sheet music of the pieces you're supposed to study, paying for airfare to a competition or an audition recording session, even concert clothes. I used to mm -hmm. try to get stuff at the thrift store and fix it up. Um, mm -hmm. You know, new strings for your violin, your piano accompanist fees, all of that really adds up, and that's where we come in and make the difference. You know, you face so many obstacles, economic and otherwise, but, but um, in reading about you, most folks who know your work, who know a little bit about your background, also know you had a, a experienced a terrible accident. Um, Chicago train or subway? Well, it was a suburban line. A suburban line. Yeah. What year? 95, almost, 10, almost 20 years ago. And you walked away from that changed dramatically. How? Well, yes and no. I mean, certainly the physical injuries I sustained were massive, and it took 14 years and more than 40 surgeries to complete round one of putting me back together. And, you know, that's, that's a lot. Um, but, you know, I look at what other people have to go through. I've never had a disease, for example. No. You know, so it's like what I dealt with was serious, but on the other hand, somehow or another, the skills that I gained as a young person um, during my student years, just holding on to hope that things would work out even if I couldn't quite see how, and having that perseverance <clears throat> and that faith, um, I think those parts of my personality, um, I was able to call upon them when this, this next circumstance um, arose. So you're about to play in a little bit, but I just want to be clear on something. Your ability to move around is not what it was because? Um, yeah, so I, I had injuries to my lower limbs and, you know, um, rely on the latest in modern technology um, yeah. to help me, help me walk. But luckily, you know, you play your violin with your upper half. <laughs> so uh, and so the good. whole positive attitude thing, which people can often trivialize, you live it every day. You don't just talk about it, you live it. Well, I definitely, others. I definitely, you know, if anybody is going through something challenging, stressful in their life, I definitely don't want to be one of those people who's like, oh, just, you know, smile and mm -hmm. get through it. Because certainly I had more than my fair share of moments that, you know, I was disheartened and, you know, had to try to figure out, you know, what does life mean and how am I going to make it and things like that. But, you know, I just looked to my friends for support. And your and, family. You have a little and one? And I am a glass half full person. You have a little one? A child? I do. How old? Yes. Um, three years old. And you tour with your child and your husband? I do. Well, my husband's been traveling with me since 96. And he runs a computer company, exactly. I think, while he's on the road. Yeah, and he has to operate on U.S. business hours, <laughs> no matter where we are on the planet. So it's pretty that's nuts. Great. But much better than a Skype marriage, that's for oh, sure. Oh, I love it. And we have a nanny from an agency of nannies for traveling musicians. I love this. So it's the four of us everywhere we go. Well, what are you going to perform for us? Well, I thought I don't have a whole orchestra with me today, but I can still just give you a little preview from one of the Mozart concertos by playing uh, my own cadenza that I wrote for the first movement of my favorite one, number three in G major. A cadenza is? Um, it's kind of like the guitar solo at the end of a rock song where you get to improv <laughs> on kind of the melodies from the tune. So it's my own original composition, but it's taking Mozart's melodies and sort of playing around with them. And you will not be breaking into any heavy metal, I just want to clarify. Probably not. Probably, I just want to clarify. <laughs> uh, Rachel Barton Pine, I want to thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to listening to you, okay? Thank you. Great. Just check it out.
see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. David Jefferson Jr. is youth and young adult minister, Metropolitan Baptist Church, program director of a great program called My Brother's Keeper in Newark, New Jersey. Good to see you. Thank you so much for having me here. For those who do not know, My Brother's Keeper is? Well, My Brother's Keeper is an exciting rollout initiative from our president, Barack Obama, um, intended to provide opportunities for young men of color and young Latino men as well. Um, it's an offering out of uh, the president that he noticed that there was a major issue, um, even before what we see that is going on currently now in current events with um, uh, throughout the nation. You were uh, taping this on December the 5th, Eric Garner, the situation uh, um, out in Ferguson, Michael Brown, a um, lot going on. A lot going on and you can feel uh, the temperature rising, but what's exciting is, is, is that it's good to know that there have been some initiatives that have been underway to try to address this even before it's come to fruition. And I think it speaks to the timing um, of the day. It also speaks to the component that we need to put something actionary in place instead of just reacting. Um, and so it's gonna be interesting to see where we head from here with this initiative across the nation because it's cities across the nation who are accepting this challenge to provide change from what is occurring. Why you? Uh, good question. I, to say why me, um, you know, I've been working in this sector for about 14 years. I started out young working in the youth developmental programming component. Um, I was able to start a nonprofit organization. Tell folks about the church. Well, the church, uh, I'm a third generation Baptist preacher. Um, Tell folks what that means. What that means, my grandfather was a Baptist preacher from Louisiana and my father uh, is, a, is a pastor here as well. At Metropolitan Baptist Church. Correct. A lot of history there. A lot of history. Um, you, you could even say one of, the, one, one of Dr. King's greatest messages that he ever preached was at Metropolitan Baptist Church. So we have a good legacy. Uh, our membership base is strong. Um, you know, our senator is a member. The mayor, uh, Roz Baraka, frequents and he comes through as a member. So we're kind of tied into the community, but we also have connections in regards to... Um, those that want to come and, and be involved in a spiritual environment and, and, and grow from there. So we're doing well, doing well. You know, given everything we were talking about before and given, again, we're taping the program when we're taping and at the end of 2014, this program will be seen, we'll seen, be seen after that. Mm -hmm. We don't know how things are going to play out. The federal government, the Justice Department, Department of Justice will be very much involved mm -hmm. in these civil rights cases now. Good, yes. All right. Policemen, our relations are what they are mm. and are not where they need to be. So how do you see, Dave, the role of the church in all this? I'm glad you asked that question. Um, Steve, I'll be honest with you. I, my foundation relies in the fact that I have a strong uh, belief in hope with faith. And so... You have faith in the justice system? I have, I have faith in the, the divine system, which I think has power over this particular justice system. And what does that mean? You know, I take it back to even the foundation of this country. There was still a component of faith there uh, when you look at the structuring of America. And what that says to me is, you know, those founding fathers were confident that there was a higher component, a divine, um, in the structuring of this. So... You know, I have that hope and I have that faith. And I know a lot of individuals push back on me because of that, but I think that that trust and that faith and that hope can push the judicial system to a place of understanding for all. Um, I still do believe in that. I mean, we still speak of God in the judicial system. We, in God we trust is stated and, and we, mm. we stand before God with the Bible and the judicial system in the courts. So mm. um, I think we've taken the focus away from there has been a battle between good and evil from the beginning of time. But how do we as human beings galvanize around good and evil and recognize that it has nothing even to do with this hue that we wear, this color of our skin that is, it seems to be a differential, but in all, you know, in, all, in all reality, if you study it, we created race. Humankind is, 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 is a dialogue that we 
have kind of gone away from. And, um, and I think with faith, because I have friends across the board that are atheists, that are Muslim, but when we get together, there's a humankind component that I think we're missing out on here. Um, and you're, you feel strongly that your message is resonating, particularly with young black men, Latino mm -hmm. young men, teenagers, mm -hmm. who particularly post, and Michael Brown, people decide for themselves. Eric Gardner is tougher mm -hmm. for a lot of folks because it seems more clear cut. Mm -hmm. It seems. You talk to those folks, you talk to the young men and women, particularly black and Latino, and you say, hey, listen, have faith. Mm -hmm. And they say? Uh, initially, they're, they're, they push back on me right now. Um, have faith in what? <sighs> the pushback comes because there has to be a, a period of mourning. Um, you know, we study this. I'm in theology school now at Princeton studying, and one of the components that we have to go through is, you know, whenever there's a death, there's a stage, and there's stages that you need to go through sure. um, to come out of it. And what we're seeing now... Elizabeth Kubler-Ross taught us that, right? That's very true, yes. I mean, and, and, and it's working itself where that model is one that I'm able to draw on because, you know, I've, I've read... Look at heavily. the background you have. Okay, all right. <laughs> look at the background. Look at the advantage. Right. I mean, I'm not going to argue with you, but it must be incredibly difficult given your background, your mm -hmm. theological background, the mm -hmm. reading, the research, the studying. And you got this kid who's sitting there saying, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. But that's right why I have to challenge him, Steve. I, I mean, I'll be real honest you with you. Spike you know what we haven't done? Uh, uh, no, Chris Rock said, I think Chris Rock's tweet right after it. Did you see what he said? No, I didn't see I didn't see He's sitting there killing, killing us right on film now. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, who am I to say, you know, what he should or shouldn't say? But when he says that, and a lot of young people respond, they're like, you're right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I, that's why I asked faith in what? That the federal government comes in and you're saying there's a, something more powerful than the federal government. Yeah, I, I am because, you know, growing up and, and being exposed to, uh, you know, and I call him Uncle Al, but Reverend Al Sharpton and, and Uncle Jesse, I was at the knees of these men um, at a young age watching them fight for justice for people who couldn't speak for themselves, right. um, not only here in these streets, but in corporate boardrooms, we had issues with diversity. And so there was a push there that after the baby boomers came through and affirmative action worked so well, um, we saw components in America where we were reaching places of equality, but only to see that it would be dissipated. And so what I say to these young people, um, and first of all, I have to stay a couple on, seconds, go ahead. I have to stay on the narrative. The narrative is this, good if we gather around it together will overcome evil at any time. Got no choice. No choice. It, it'll play is not acceptable. Up. Not at all. David Jefferson Jr., I want to thank you for joining us, and we'll keep track of my brother's keeper as well, and also Metropolitan uh, Baptist Church. We uh, appreciate you. Keep doing what you're doing. Stephen, you as well. Thank you so much for having me. You got it. Stay with us in NJ Pack uh, right after this. Good stuff. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. John Schreiber, President and Chief Executive Officer of this place, NJ Pack, New Jersey Performing Arts Center. Hey, you had us here again. Well, <laughs> one on one at NJ Pack. Absolutely. How right. great is this? No, again, it's, we did it. it's wonderful. Thanks and for having us. Yeah, happy to have you. Yeah. Every season. Yeah. yeah. Um, real quick. Yes. The top two, three things going on at NJ Pack in 2015. Oh, gosh. Well, I mean, the, the expectation that we are going to break ground uh, in first quarter on a 21 story residential tower across the street, and uh, the hope that uh, maybe in in half of that retail space, NJTV will move in in a few years. And, That's right. And, uh, and what that is is, is over 230 uh, market rate apartments um, to help transform this neighborhood. Why is that, you know, for people who love NJ Pack and know it as a cultural institution, an uh, anchor, this part of town, the city overall, economic development, 
mm -hmm. supposed to be part of the job? Oh, absolutely. Why? Yeah. I mean, when Governor Kane and Larry Goldman and Ray Chambers and Sharp James, when those guys got together 25 years ago and started uh, devising the art center, um, in addition to the theaters, they also acquired more land around uh, the campus, uh, and that land was was for just these purposes. That for, was the vision? Yeah, sure. For residential, for business, for for a, a really robust and, and diverse uh, community. And it's happening. It's happening. It's taken a while, but it's happening. There's uh, this refurbishment and refreshment of Military Park, which is now as Talk pretty... Talk about that. Oh, gosh. It's, it's right across the street from us, of That's course. Right. It's been here for for a hundred years and it's as beautiful an urban park space as any in the country right now. Uh, it's activated with all sorts of activities uh, during the day and, and, and Prudential of course is you know, building that uh, massive headquarters uh, across the park and, and you know the Haynes building uh, is being refurbished for residential and for Rutgers. It's happening. Our hope is that we're going to move our arts training programs uh, into that building as well. Which so programs? Our, all our arts training programs. Uh, education. We're going to take our education programs and, and ideally move them in over John, there. John, do us a favor. Uh, we, we know a little bit about arts education here, which is a huge part of the NJ PAC portfolio. For those who don't know and just think, oh, people come and perform there. Tell folks about arts education. Oh, gosh. I mean, before they broke ground on the building, uh, we were operating arts education programs for uh, newer kids and, and then more broadly kids from around the region. And now, uh, over 60,000 kids a year uh, either attend performances here at the Art Center, and for many of these kids, this is the first time they have seen live entertainers, live musicians and actors on a stage. That's transformational for some kids, right? And then we do arts training. We teach kids uh, musical instruments. We teach them theater. We teach them dance. And then we go into about 200 schools uh, every season around the region. And we go in for residencies that can last for 10 to 12 sessions. So, so education is a really important part of, uh, of, of who we are as an institution. We have to sort of build the next generation of, uh, of, of arts lovers. And we know that when kids get involved with the arts, they think differently. Yeah. There's more reason for them to wake up in the morning and want to go to school because of an opportunity to engage in an arts activity. Couldn't be more important. The other part of uh, the NJ PAC story is interesting because we're here every year. We come here to tape one on one at NJ PAC and also we do specials. Um, a couple years ago, we had uh, Governor Christie here, huge right. audience, right? Exactly. Tonight, we're taping, we're actually taping on December the 5th. Tonight, we have our two United States senators sitting here yeah, in this great. room mm -hmm. um, before a large audience. Uh, they never, they've never before done this, come together before a live audience to talk yeah, about. I hope they get national. along. You know. yeah, yeah, well, they, they do get along. <laughs> I said, don't jinx it, will you? <laughs> and you know, this is something that John and I have been working on together with Neil Shapiro. Our, our leader at uh, WNET and NJTV and, and Johnson Video. The reason I mention all this is this. A big part of the NJ PAC portfolio is partnerships, is it not? Absolutely, yeah. We, we see ourselves very much as a collaborator with all sorts of institutions, whether it's public television like you guys. Talk about the, uh, the, the American... Um, American Song Series? Yeah, come on. Yeah, well, that is a five-part series that we taped with you guys uh, a few months ago. It will premiere in January, um, and of course, it being public television, it will be played thousands of times over the for the millennium. Wonderful music and, performance. Oh, the best music in the world. Yeah, John Pizzarelli, uh, uh, Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman, uh, Maureen McGovern, uh, all sorts of. And people. you don't get to see, you would never get to see that otherwise. Oh no 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 yeah right yeah, yeah. and this is the. Wonderful music, and and I have to tell you, I've seen the I've seen the the roughs, and it's uh, it's a beautifully shot show. Uh, the partnerships, the TD. Let's talk about the James TD Moody. James Moody Democracy at Jazz Festival. Because we had Christian McBride, your and, partner, and Nick um, Maselli. And talk about and Nick Maselli, our partner. Right. Talk about that collaboration because that's big. It happens in November. We curate more jazz here than anybody else in the state. We're really proud of that. Uh, TD came on as the sponsor of the Moody Festival. Prudential is also involved as a season sponsor of what we do in jazz. Christian, as you know, is our jazz advisor, and uh, we do about 20 different jazz events over the course of the year. This is uh, America's original art form. There's an art form that uh, uh, was really robust in Newark uh, throughout the 20th century, and mm -hmm. now we have this great ability to bring it back. 
We have a broadcast facility here now, uh, thanks to uh, Panasonic and, and, to, and to Prudential. And uh, that will enable us to capture a lot of what we do in music and, and bring it way beyond the four walls. John, I know you love your job, um, yes. not just because you do great things here, but uh, you get to partner with other great people like us. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Especially you. No, right? listen, John, I want to thank you for being our partner, for allowing us to be here to do great things together and uh, is a wonderful venue. Thank it's, you, buddy. Uh, it's our honor. Thank you. Okay. Okay. We're coming back next year. You can't stop us. <laughs> All right? That's a deal. I don't want to stop you. <laughs> One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence, and by the New Jersey Performing Arts Center in cooperation with NJTV and 13 for WNET. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato at NJ Pack has been provided by Prudential Financial's Global Communications Department, United Airlines, the New Jersey Education Association, NJ Best, Josh S. Weston, Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, the law firm of Gibbons PC. Promotional support provided by The Record, North Jersey's trusted source, and NorthJersey.com. And by NJ Biz, all business, all New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Did you know that the enrollment period under the Affordable Care Act ends February 15th? For those who are still uninsured, you may be eligible for financial support. But those who do not sign up for insurance must pay a fine of $325 or more. Every plan covers preventative care, doctor visits, and prescriptions. And with over 40 plans to choose from, you have every opportunity to get on the road to health.